What's going on, guys? It's Illuminostic, and welcome to Psychedelic Mysteries History. The history of psychedelic mysteries, or something to that effect. <laughs> We're also going to be looking forward. Uh, I feel like I've kind of neglected um, the subject of psychedelic medicine, psychedelic philosophy, and the relationship between psychedelics and the occult and consciousness for a little while on this channel because there has been a lot of other stuff on my mind. But today I was putting together a uh, video series on um, psychedelic luminaries like Aldous Huxley and Timothy Leary that I feel are being forgotten. What's going on, Arana? Uh, and I don't like that very much because it's not just... It's not just this thing of like honoring tradition or, you know, or lineage or influences. What's going on, Toucan? Um, is that like Toucan? Uh, are you like doubly conservative? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, there's more to it than that. There are elements of the messages of these people that I think are being lost. By the way, you guys, don't forget to hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. My subscriber number has been plummeting this week. Um, and I'm going to do a separate live stream where I'm going to talk about why I think that is. Um, I made the mistake, I guess, of trying to defend um, certain people that felt like it was an attack, even though it was meant to be, like, you know, assistance. Um, so pretty crazy. Uh, anyways, uh, don't want to, don't want to go down that rabbit hole at the moment, but, um, yeah, so the message that, uh, these people were offering to humanity and the importance of it has been lost, you know, like for example, in the case of Aldous Huxley, uh, the prescience of his assessment of the trajectory of, of humanity uh, is downright prophetical. And you guys probably know what I'm referencing, Brave New World, right? It's absolutely insane. I mean, down to like virtual reality helmets uh, and SSRIs and Xanax. And it was 1931 when the book was written. You know, this, this stuff is, out, and by the way, in Huxley's case, that was actually before any contact with uh, psychedelics. Uh, he wrote that book well before he ever um, experienced mescaline, which was his first experience. He ended up writing uh, The Doors of um, Perception and Heaven and Hell uh, based on those mescaline experiences. But we're going to get into all that later. For now, what I want to do is really start at the earliest acknowledgement of the influence of psychedelic compounds on humanity. And I'm really going to do my best in this stream uh, to offer information that you're likely not going to find anywhere else, or at least to connect information uh, with related information in ways that you will not find anywhere else. I'm quite confident that I can do that. Um, and this is one of those instances, actually. <laughs> Um, most of the researchers trace the earliest contact with psilocybin mushrooms to, um, or the first evidence to uh, cave paintings in France, I believe it is. Um, but that's actually not necessarily the oldest record that we have of the use of psychedelics. Uh, in South America a few years ago, there was a hollowed out puma bone uh, that had traces of DMT in it uh, because some shaman way, way back in the day had apparently been smoking either um, Adenanthera peregrina or Adenanthera colubrina, uh, which you would know as Yopo or Wilka, uh, the seed snuff that's blown into the nose. Um, it's also said by a lot of people that that is actually... How, um, how, well, there were no tribes there. It was Neanderthals or, or like just after Neanderthals, like Stone Age. I don't know, 5,000 years ago, roughly, cave paintings that they think depict people eating hallucinogenic mushrooms. That's the story. But this puma bone is at least that old, and there are indications that there could be even older use of uh, Yopo and Wilka that actually predates um, the mushroom. And what I was going to say is that, uh, a lot of people actually claim that the Yopo was actually the stepping stone to ayahuasca. That uh, what actually happened is that um, the shamans figured out how to use um, Yopo, and during the trance, the plant spirits told them how to make ayahuasca. 
I don't think that makes any sense at all whatsoever, and I think it's complete bullshit uh, for a number of reasons. But the main reason is that uh, I have so far only heard white people on YouTube talking about that. I, have n I live in South America amongst indigenous people. I've been studying this stuff for 30 years. I've never seen any uh, until recently. So I think that's just something the Internet has created, honestly. I think it happened the other way around because Yopo is actually more difficult um, it's a more complicated process that involves heating snail shells until they turn to ash and then breaking that all down and mixing it with the seeds at a certain ratio. And it just it would be easier to make ayahuasca. Um, and so at any rate, uh, either way, these plants have been in use uh, with <clears throat> and by humanity for a very, very, very long time. And the reason that that is so significant and important uh, is something that I believe was first suggested by Terence McKenna, although I have to admit that he is occasionally credited for ideas that actually came from people like Aldous Huxley and even Aleister Crowley, uh, because he has become sort of the mainstream pipeline conduit for all of our psychedelic forefathers, uh, and everything kind of trickled down to us um, through Terence McKenna, uh, including a lot of the connections to uh, the Hermetic Mysteries. Um, it, it turns out um, I had developed these interests uh, independently of that influence. Um, I was very young when I started to study the mysteries and psychedelics separately, and it was many years before I realized that a lot of these other psychedelic luminaries had also studied both subjects. And again, we'll see why, uh, for a <laughs> very good reason, there's uh, very obvious and very profound connections um, that not only uh, suggest possible answers for us in our current chaostrophy and the, the uh, predicament we find ourselves in, um, but the, they open doors to a lot of other questions uh, as well. And so back to the psilocybin mushroom. And this is, uh, I think, sort of a reflection of where we find ourselves today at um, the juncture with another leap in the evolutionary paradigm, at least in terms of consciousness. Uh, and the thing about leaps in consciousness is that they actually do require hardware upgrades you cannot run a Apple app on a 1984 Commodore 64. And in just the same way that that is true, you cannot run advanced uh, consciousness programs on a brain that is not uh, prepared to run that level of program, right? So this is where the neuroplasticity and neurogenesis comes in. Um, and so every time mankind has made one of these leaps, psychedelic plants have entered the picture and provided the catalyst and also uh, conferred the ability to upgrade the hardware. Um, and the last time that this happened, and of course it should be taken for granted that everything that I'm saying is theoretical, although supported by at least anecdotal evidence, um, the stoned ape theory that people are fairly well familiar with at this point. Um, I think that since the stoned ape theory sort of originated, uh, there have been sort of addendums that have been added by people like Paul Stamets. Um, we have seen uh, fungal entities, I guess, like single-celled slime molds uh, develop intelligence in certain very specific, um, very... Um, what is it called when your intelligence only works along a certain lines? You know, highly specialized intelligence, uh, like in the case of these slime molds. Ten viewers, three likes, not cool guys, come on, I'm working hard for this. Uh, slime molds that could out-engineer uh, the best engineers in Japan using the best computers that we had, right? And then we also have mycelium demonstrating um, awareness, according to studies commissioned by Paul Stamets. Uh, and we also, since I think think the origin of the stoned ape theory, uh, that this development in genetics came after that, um, when it was first posited by the McKenna brothers, probably in the late 70s, early 70s, mid 70s, somewhere around there. Um, that, uh, like, and what is it, like 90% of our DNA is fungal, right? So we have this profound relationship um, that 
not only do we share this uh, genetic relationship with fungus, um, but we also, uh, the fungus exhibits a lot of behaviors and gives a lot of indications that it has these connections to consciousness that we uh, consider to be unique amongst ourselves. You understand what I mean? And so um, the theory, of course, of the stoned ape is that uh, it was contact with psilocybin mushrooms that uh, caused the uh, consciousness of humans to move beyond the pragmatic and practical, right? So, you know, you only had to communicate to people, there's water over there, or there's a saber-toothed tiger over there, or, you know, these really basic things that could more or less be communicated with grunts. Um, or pointing and grunting or whatever. Uh, but with the psychedelic experience, now there are abstract concepts. Uh, there's a connection with the transcendent other. Um, and all of these kind of um, abstract and, uh, you know, art and uh, experience of the transcendental that nature does not give us um, immediate tools to communicate about. And so the idea is that it did two things. It created a, a biological hardware upgrade so that we were capable of running more sophisticated programs. Uh, and we know that that is true um, because the uh, compounds catalyze neural genesis, which means like, you know, how quickly we're developing new neural pathways and new brain cells. Uh, and um, neuroplasticity, which enhances our ability to learn, right? So we suddenly have more to say and a greater capacity to do so, to communicate. There are also indications, I think at least anecdotal, but you know, going back from uh, e experiments in the 1960s all the way to the diaries of Sir Walter Raleigh, in regards to uh, ayahuasca, for example, um, that indicate telepathy and the possibility that these compounds actually confer on us, uh, albeit maybe an intermittent and not reliable uh, ability to access uh, uh, capacities of consciousness that are not normally engaged, um, which might fall under the, the category of ESP or um, parapsychological phenomena. And so that is the beginning of the psychedelic story in uh, theory, if not in practice. And so um, many, 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 many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years later, I think hundreds of thousands, I'm not really sure about the exact timeline here, uh, we enter into ancient Egypt. Uh, possibly Greece, but the story seems to have begun in Egypt. And if that's the case, then the um, compounds that we would be um, looking for, aside from blue lotus, which is actually a very interesting uh, psychoactive flower, um, but probably not the culprit that we're after in this case, um, Syrian rue combined with acacia would actually produce something very, very similar to ayahuasca. And anyone that's taken ayahuasca can tell you that it's a whole different animal from the rest of these psychedelics. While it is true that you could take an extraordinarily high dose of psilocybin mushrooms or LSD or something and sort of get a ballpark idea, there's something fundamentally different about the DMT experience. Uh, and it also seems to um, activate the pineal gland uh, and I do mean that quite literally, and I feel like we're on the verge of being ac actually able to prove that. Uh, I'm actually discouraged that, um, or and confused that there have been less um, experiments, none that I'm, I'm aware of, uh, in recent years to kind of explore this. Um, but the point is that that combination of plants would have been readily available to people in ancient Egypt.
And so we have the story of Pythagoras having gone to Egypt and uh, studied the mysteries. And of course, the mysteries being secret, um, still to this day, you know, you're sworn by uh, the threat of having your tongue cut out of your head uh, and all sorts of other horrors if you divulge the secrets of um, the apopteia, which is the uh, hidden knowledge of these secret societies. Um, you know, the threat of death. Uh, so Pythagoras traveled from um, Egypt, theoretically again, to uh, Greece, where he founded his mystery schools that dealt with subjects that are connected to music and consciousness and the occult and the fundamental nature of reality and these sort of explorations. And from there, uh, there were mystery schools that branched out. And we know these as the Eleusinian Mysteries and others. And we also know with near certainty that there was something called the Kaikion, uh, and there was Soma, uh, which inspired the name of Aldous Huxley's um, pill that kind of did the opposite thing that psychedelics do in Brave New World. Um, but we're still way back in ancient Greece now. We haven't caught up with Huxley yet. Uh, and so uh, the Eleusinian Mysteries had quite the roster, Aristotle, Plato, um, all sorts of extraordinary figures uh, were coming to these things and consuming whatever it is that was in that vessel. And my suspicion is that it was the Syrian Rue Acacia mixture uh, that Pythagoras learned about in Egypt, but that would have been readily available in the Mediterranean. Both plants are totally everywhere there. So um, just for the sake of argument, though, and Albert Hoffman, uh, the discoverer of LSD, did actually, how's it going, Misty, did actually investigate this, and he brewed the ergot fungus, um, which is the uh, basically the source of the precursor chemicals uh, that LSD is synthesized from. Um, ergot alkaloids. It's funny too that ergot is like ergo, which is I am, and it's all about metacognition and like, you know, knowledge of self. It's, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Um, but anyways, the ergo fungus. <laughs> um, uh, so, okay, so that's the other potential likelihood. And there's some evidence that it w either was uh, the ergot beer or that that was at least also, um, here, I gotta turn this off. I think it overheats or something and then blinks. Um, where was I at with this? Oh yeah, there's evidence of the ergot brew uh, because they have found it in the teeth of um, at least one skull. And ergot, if you do not process it first, um, it will not just kill you, but it will give you symptoms of gangrene, you will lose your mind, your limbs will rot off. It's very similar to mercury poisoning. And this brings us to a little um, like uh, tendril, a uh, side um, tributary of the story, because uh, the teachings of Hermes and uh, Thoth in Egypt uh, are mercurial. And uh, mercury was a um, psychopomp that um, brought the dead uh, cross to the underworld and also that it sort of serves this Promethean or Luciferian light bearer kind of um, role where this divine knowledge is brought down to mankind and usually at some kind of great penalty. Uh, you know, Christ was also one of these figures that kind of played this role. Um, but uh, Mercury is actually found um, in around the tombs of several rulers in both Egypt and in uh, a tribe that was related to the Aztecs. Uh, so that is really just mind-blowing to me because it, either they both understood the nature of Mercury and the symbolic meaning of it, um, or there was actually a physical connection between these cultures that has not necessarily been elucidated. I know there are people that have suggested things. There, have, There's drawings of white guys with beards and stuff that shouldn't be there. And um, But the reality is we don't have a truly uh, clear answer. Let me look at the chat real quick. Uh, 
Um, okay, so uh, I don't want to get too far off on this hermetic mercurial trip quite yet, although um, there's a lot of incredible connections. And uh, this is one of those things when I was thinking about originally putting this video series together and doing this live stream, um, you know, I, I think I get this feedback sometimes that I'm like messing with plant medicine or something by introducing uh, these hermetic and mystery school teachings and all that. And the reality is that all of these guys, going all the way back to Aleister Crowley, but Terrence McKenna, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, uh, Timothy Leary, all of these Western figures in psychedelics all were deeply, deeply, deeply influenced and entrenched in this stuff. So um, if anything, I feel like I'm just, uh, you know, I just don't think we should forget about this. Um, and... Uh, all right, so the ergot, the ergot or the acacia. But the important thing is this. Um, during the period when these mysteries were happening in ancient Greece, it was a time of, uh, it was a time of you know, great advances in poetry and philosophy and mathematics and astronomy. There was all kinds of culture and science just absolutely exploding. And for a very long time now, I think 2,000 years or so, right people uh historians are like what the fuck was happening why was everyone so smart like why were they so creative what was going on you know and um one of the one of the things that you notice in that that is absent in the writings of a lot of these people is a fear of the unknown and fear of the mystery they were willing to investigate and uh, to contemplate and to admit that they had a fundamental lack of knowledge in regards to a lot of these things that in the modern world people have either just decided not to think about by calling themselves rationalist, materialist, atheist, whatever, um, or they have faith-based solutions that are, you know, 99.9 .9 with a thousand nines uh, percent likely to be wrong. Um, you know what I mean? Either solution, no good. So what is this variable? You know, what did they have in ancient Greece that we have been missing from our society? Because we retained a lot of it. We retained a lot of the sciences. We retained a lot of the philosophy. We retained things like democracy, political influence, all of this stuff. But clearly we're missing something. And a big clue to that comes in the writings of Plato, where he says that the um, reception of the apoptie, which is the secret knowledge of the inner circle uh, of the uh, mysteries, um, relieved him of his fear of death. And uh, research has shown us uh, beyond any reasonable uh, you know, doubt that the best way to prepare terminal cancer patients and other people that are on death's door in hospices uh, to meet their maker is with massive doses of psychedelics. In fact, uh, one of Aldous Huxley's um, most gangster moves that he is uh, so widely remembered for was to take two very large doses back to back of LSD uh, injected while he was on his deathbed. So I think about two hours before he died, he had his second very, very large dose of LSD. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, that that revelation may seem in a way to be inconsequential, but I don't think it is at all because, you know, there are two things that are driving the chaostrophy uh, in Western culture more than anything else. And they both have their root in fear, uh, but it's fear of the unknown and fear of death. And these things manifest in all sorts of different ways, including greed. Um, but, you know, the fundamental root is the same. And the, excuse me, antidote to that fear happens to come from compounds like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca. Uh, in my opinion, for what it's worth, the reason is probably that what they actually do is that they don't cause hallucinations. They peel back the um, filtration system uh, in our nervous system. As Aldous Huxley said, they, the reducing valve, uh, they turn them off or down, down. Most of them turn them down, right? Like even a heroic dose of mushrooms just turns it down. It doesn't turn it off. 
A massive dose of 5-MeO-DMT, on the other hand, turns the whole thing all the way off. That's what people are describing. You know, there's nothing there. Just this, like, blinding white light, for lack of a better description, and a feeling of absolute unity and peace with eternity. There's no time. There's no desire. There's no will. There is just absolutely fucking nothing. But it's blissful. <laughs> but it's nothing. Um, and so I think, you know... Perhaps it's not actually possible to assuage the fear of death uh, or the fear of the unknown. Um, so the only real antidote is to experience um, the ultimate reality, that which we will unite with, um, whether it's after a series of incarnations or after this life or however it works, um, to have that experience and then come back, now you're no longer afraid because you've been there, done that. I think that's the obvious, <laughs> you know, that's the obvious answer here. Not really that hard to understand, um, you know, that that would be the only real solution um, to that uh, issue. And so, but <clears throat> we're not trying to really go too far down the rabbit hole of psychedelic medicine or... Um, you know, any of that stuff. I'm trying to actually give a sort of uh, baseline uh, timeline for all of the stuff that happens. Because what you guys will find if you learn the history of how psychedelics um, came to be uh, the first Renaissance, let's call it Renaissance 1.0. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, because it actually started in the 30s, uh, really. I mean, it or the 40s started to build some momentum through the 50s and then really exploded on the public scene in the mid-60s, right? But a lot of people don't really know how that happened. And um, the actual story is so insane with such uh, improbability or probability-defying synchronicities um, like Timothy Leary uh, goes out in search of ayahuasca, which they called Yahe back then. They still call it Yahe in Colombia, and, um, but that's how they knew it, is what I'm saying. Uh, and another guy named William S. Burroughs, who was famous as one of the characters in uh, what was that beatnik guy, Jack Kerouac's On the Road, um, which was, of course, like a precursor to the hippie culture. Um, so this guy was literally a character in that book, but he was real, you know. Um, and just an absolute monster, lunatic. I mean, uh, I, I, we're not going to talk about William S. Burroughs too much, but he was a significant figure in all of this, love it or hate it. Um, and so he was trying to get rid of his heroin habit, and he had heard of this crazy psychedelic called Yahe. So he goes down to South America looking for it. Timothy Leary separately doesn't know him, has never met him in his life, goes down there, and they run into each other in some, like, you know, canteen, canteen, or I can't remember how they put it, but basically a little tiny bar in a shack in the 1950s in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon rainforest. And it's in his book, High Priest. Leary talks about walking into this bar, and, and there's this guy sitting there, and it's William S. Burroughs. Like, what is that? How You know what I mean? Like, what are the chances? And there's just so much of that, the way that these people intersected. Um, it's actually been fodder for the uh, conspiracy theory people to say, you know, clearly this isn't real. Um, and it's strange because so many of them believe in God, but they don't think that it could have been a hidden hand. It has to be the government. That's always really boggled my mind that... Um, they see it that way, rather than realize this is like, if anything, divine intervention, you know? And <laughs> these coincidences and stuff are also impossible because they had to happen. We would be utterly doomed if they had not. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously where I lean. <laughs> but I guess if you believe that anything that's not Jesus that has any kind of spiritual connotations is definitely Satan, then that's how you're going to resolve all this. Well, then it's the CIA who's run by Satan. And anyways, um, yeah, it's unfortunate that all that stuff entered into the equation and people's perception uh, because it really slowed down our momentum, I think. Um, but so uh, where are we at in this? Okay, so we have just left ancient... Um, Greece and the Eleusinian mysteries, and we have established a 
connection and a need uh, between our culture and that ancient culture, and we have ascertained that psychedelics seem to be the missing component um, that, you know, has sort of things didn't work as well for us as they did for the Greeks. And I'm not saying that it was perfect. Obviously, there was some weird shit going on and they had some problems. But, you know, in general, it was like, you know, way longer and, and way smoother <laughs> for those guys than it's been for us. Um, and psychedelics were probably to think. Now we are going to have to allow a character to enter into our story that a lot of people uh, do not find... Um, agreeable <laughs> to put it mildly uh but the next major player uh to enter into this story is someone named alistair crowley and a lot of people don't think about him at all when you think about psychedelics um and this whole process of the dissemination of this knowledge and you know people suddenly having a commitment to the pursuit of higher consciousness and gnosis and you know um, but it, it's, that guy is just as big of an influence on our modern culture as literally anyone. And it's incredible because a magician, by definition, by his definition, was someone that exerts an invisible influence on the human race. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, he has shaped um, so many things in your daily life, and you don't, you know, most people don't even know his name or think about him, it's pretty fucking remarkable. Um, for good or ill. And I think for good overall, the guy definitely wasn't perfect, but um, he wrote some of the early, you know, there was also Bald Ladere and, and other people that experimented with opium and hashish and cocaine and heroin and all of these things back in the day. But Crowley was one of the first um, and certainly the first to go public with this, uh, being bisexual and uh, defending that publicly, you know, openly bisexual. Uh, and um, promoting this idea of expanding consciousness through meditation, yoga, uh, study of the mysteries, actual initiation into hermetic secret societies, and the use of drugs like mescaline. He was one of the very first people to publish papers uh, about his mescaline experience and um, about hashish and, uh, for good or ill, a lot of the other drugs as well, and very, very large quantities on very, very regular basis. And so um, even though I absolutely do advocate reading his best works, like the Book of Lies and studying maybe um, the Book of the Law, uh, with the magical and philosophical commentary that you can find on hermetic.com. Um, the important thing to know about him is that, you know, Timothy Leary, for example, said of Aleister Crowley on television in the 1970s um, that he felt like he was continuing his work, basically almost implying that he felt that he was a reincarnation of Aleister Crowley. Um, Terrence McKenna also uh, made an absolutely terrible movie um, called... Uh, uh, I don't know the name of it, but it, he was supposed to be John D, who was a partner with Edward Kelly, who were magicians and scribes to Queen Elizabeth, I think. Um, a couple of really wacky dudes, but they channeled this uh, alleged angelic language called Enochian that has actually been studied by uh, grammatic, um, you know, grammaticists, I guess, uh, linguistic. Linguitic I don't know how the hell you say that, but people that study linguistics, <laughs> linguiticians or whatever the hell they are, uh, and they determine that it actually does have a legitimate syntax and grammar. And these two guys almost definitely would not have been capable of faking that. It's like almost impossible that that's the case. So... Um, yeah, Terrence McKenna did a uh, made a movie where he was supposed to be John D. Uh, his only part was to stand there looking regal in like Victorian clothing or older than Victorian, you know. I don't know how long, way far back in the day. Um, and of course, you guys probably know that like every rock band ever in the history of music. Uh, was heavily influenced by Aleister Crowley. Uh, the Beatles, he was in the top left corner of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin bought Boleskine House, where Crowley lived. Um, Ozzy Osbourne's song, Mr. Crowley. Hall & Oates, Sting said that he studied uh, Crowley's work five hours a day for like 10 years. Um, let's see, Sting... I know. I mean, I don't have to go through it. You guys know it's everyone, 
everyone. So um, monumentally important influence. Um, and it was from, uh, oh, and this is interesting too. Crowley came to the United States and he went to San Francisco and he went to Greenwich Village. You guys know anything about those two places? He actually claimed to have left consciousness bombs of some type, like a, a bomb. That's how he described it, that there would be an explosion of this consciousness uh, in both of those places at some point in the future. And those are the two places where the psychedelic renaissance began in the United States. So super, super weird. Um, <laughs> super weird. And of course, uh, his influence on uh, the Grateful Dead and other people uh, would have a lot of, you know, the whole idea of everyone having their own sovereignty um, and nobody telling anyone else what to do and discovering your deepest, truest purpose and pursuing it uh, with every breath and that kind of philosophy, um, ob obviously heavily influenced by um, Crowley. And so after Crowley, we had Aldous Huxley. And Aldous Huxley was a um, English author. Uh, he kind of looked like a Franken Bowie, like David, he looked exactly, when I make this video, watch it. He looks just like David Bowie, and I noticed that before I noticed that they both have that two different color eye thing going on. Um, I couldn't believe that I, I, I didn't notice that all these years. But uh, I'm, I'll, I'll put pictures of them next to each other. Um, it's really remarkable how identical they look. But uh, okay, so Huxley. Huxley basically got famous uh, as an author for writing a uh, very dry, in my opinion, pretty boring satire of English bourgeoisie uh, in the 1920s. Um, and, and maybe even a little earlier, I think he was writing for Vogue magazine by 1917 or 1921 or something like that. And um, And so I don't think that he tried mescaline until the 1950s. Uh, it could have, I think, the 1950s. Um, and of course, his his books on the subject are not that interesting um, to anyone that has actually taken mescaline, because you know you read it and you're like, yeah, that's what mescaline does. I've done this too. You know, I mean, it's not that remarkable, but for the time, it was a monumental thing because. You have to imagine, um, I'm sure most of you guys have taken psychedelics. You remember what the 1950s looked like? I mean, none of us were there, I would assume. I don't have really anybody over 60 in my audience, so most of you guys definitely weren't there. Uh, but you've seen, like, you know, clippings. We have some idea of how straight and bland and white and fucking white picket fence and, you know what I mean? It just looks like, for, for me, absolute hell on earth. Um, leave it to beaver and all that kind of shit, you know, just absolute nightmare. Um, and a lot of people like to remember it as like this wholesome um, time where everyone respected each other and and you could get away with like raping teenage girls and you know killing black people and all of this kind of shit and it's just crazy how people do that but you know what it was like you have an idea you know it was pretty messed up um, and so you know to come from that or even earlier in the case of someone like Huxley, and suddenly you're on LSD or you're on mescaline, I just cannot even imagine uh, the feeling that they must have had as like the first wave of, you know, psychedelicized humans. Um, you know, Jerry Garcia and the people in the Haight-Ashbury area in like the early 60s, I think the first time that they took LSD, it was probably 1961, 1962, something like that. Um, so even my point though, is to find a book like the doors of perception, uh, and read those stories of this compound doing these extraordinary things, uh, to Huxley's mind. Um, it must've been incredibly fascinating. Uh, and of course, you know, most of you guys probably know that the band, the doors actually took their name from, um, that book, the doors of perception. Um, I think the quote is, there is the known and the unknown, and between them is the doors, um, the doors of perception. And uh, for what it's worth, I don't really care much for any of Huxley's novels. I think they're actually kind of badly written. He was absolutely brilliant. I mean, the guy had, um, his conceptualization had outgrown or outsized, overstepped 
uh, the English language to the extent that he created seven words that were accepted into the Oxford Dictionary. Seven words. <laughs> because, you know what I mean, he's conceptualizing shit there's no language for, so they had to make new words for the guy. So, but what I'm saying about that is his essays, if you're interested in Huxley, uh, a lot of people just read Brave New World and maybe uh, The Doors of Perception and then move on because no one wants to read Chrome Yellow or After Many a Summer the Swan Dies or Tomorrow, 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 and Tomorrow or any of that stuff. Um, but you should read the essays, the collected essays. In fact, when I was like 13 years old and I first got into this stuff, um, or found Huxley, I was either 12 or 13, uh, I wanted to get this quote from one of his essays on my back, and it was something like, it is fear of the labyrinthine flux and the inhospitable strangeness of the world. And the labyrinthine flux, by the way, is a term that he came up with to describe how uh, the phenomena that we deal with is ever-changing, and it's like a maze. And so because it's always changing, uh, when we're trying to resolve some uh, metaphysical, spiritual, philosophical, political, scientific question, by the time we could be going the right way, and then there's suddenly a new wall there. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that term actually inspired the movie Labyrinth, where that was happening in the Labyrinth. Um, so it is fear of the labyrinthine flux and the inhospitable strangeness of the world that has driven men into the systems prepared for them by philosophers and the founders of religion, weary with much wandering through the maze of phenomena, frightened by the inhospitable strangeness of the world. Men have rushed into these systems as if rushing from a dark and frightening jungle into a well-lit commodious house, and men have been burned at the stake for questioning the color of a door or the shape of a window. And uh, so, you know, when I was a, when I was a, a preteen or teenager, early teenager, um, Huxley was, was my guy. And I was seriously planning to get that tattooed on my back, but I just never did it. Um, but yeah, the collected essays of um, Huxley. And so um, around the same time that uh, Huxley was uh, taking mescaline and writing books about it, um, there was... A guy in Switzerland working for Sandoz Pharmaceuticals named Dr. Albert Hoffman. And no, he was not a CIA agent. And no, this was not a government conspiracy. It's, there's, there's just no, it's just not real. Um, what he was actually doing is looking for uh, a way to, for, to um, induce vasoconstriction uh, to help with bleeding during surgery and during childbirth, and also to treat migraine headaches. In fact, uh, when I was bitten by a, a kissing bug or an assassin bug a few weeks ago, uh, months ago, actually, um, never going to recover from that fully, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, I had migraines, and they actually gave me an ergot alkaloid uh, that was isolated by Dr. Hoffman. So we actually still use some of the other... Uh, ergot derivatives that came from his um, experience, experiments with um, ergot. So, by the way, you guys, do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support my channel. People have been unsubscribing like mad all week. I, <laughs> it's like I said, I'm going to do a different stream about that to explain it. Um, literally, this entire history, all of this information, all of it I'm just doing off the top of my head. So, um, I've, I've put in the hours doing the research for you guys. So, we really do appreciate your support because I cannot continue to make this uh, content to the extent that I do unless I have some support. Um, so there are options to support in the chat and you can join our Patreon and learn all about the mysteries directly from um, the writings of 33rd Degree Masons and uh, other formerly secret works. Um, okay, so Albert Hoffman is messing around with the ergot fungus in um, Switzerland. And hold on, I have to put these... When it rains, I uh, can't hear very well. So he's messing around with this ergot fungus, and he makes uh, a series of extractions, or not really extractions, but um, synthesis. I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> Syntheses. Um, <clears throat> and the 25th one was lysergic acid diethylamide uh, tartrate 25. And the 25 only means that it is was the 25th um, derivative in that sequence of experiments or whatever. And so um, this was 1938, and he put it on the shelf, 
and uh, kind of forgot about it because he gave it to rats and he noticed their pupils dilate, but he didn't really notice anything else. Uh, there's a really great movie, by the way, called The Rats of Nim that is a cartoon that is obviously about giving LSD to rats that then become conscious and create a civilization and start talking. And it's from like the late 60s or something. It's completely awesome. Uh, it was one of my favorite cartoons when I was a very small child. It's no surprise, right? Um, but anyways, Rats of Nim aside... Uh, didn't notice anything happening to the rats. Their hair kind of stood up a little bit. Their pupils dilated. <laughs> um, but uh, no biggie. And so he put it on a shelf. And this is the one part of the story that is a little bit sketch because it can't possibly be true. And this is where the conspiracy theorists are kind of like, well, you know, we got you here because how do you explain this? He did not spill it on himself. LSD will not soak through your skin. I don't care how many... Hippies have told you that their friend was standing in line and he sweated too much and he absorbed all this. They have done experiments. It will, it will membranes like your tongue, your eyeball, your vagina, your anus, whatever, but not just through your skin. Not happen. Period. End of story. Doesn't happen. So, um, the uh, you know <clears throat> possibility is that he got some on his hand and he touched his mouth or he even rubbed his eye because it takes so little LSD and I think people. Uh, kind of underestimate the uh, true tininess <laughs> of a dose of LSD. If you take a visible amount of LSD crystal, you're probably in trouble. Um, although, uh, to the uh, credit of LSD, and it kind of adds to how astonishing and amazing it is, um, there have been several cases, 10 in total, where people accidentally snorted lines of pure crystalline LSD and uh, went to the hospital because in every case it was a group of people and somebody for whatever reason had like a gram of LSD crystal in their pocket and they put it on the table and they crushed it up and everybody did a line thinking it was MDMA or something and so they all consumed about 20,000 micrograms of LSD. They were all back to baseline within 12 hours and all of them were checked on five years later and not one of them had had a single flashback or any kind of uh, mental illness or any problems at all whatsoever and in fact they all considered it uh, the most important thing that ever happened to them so um, you know it's really important I think that we sort of dispel the myths because people say all kinds of stuff like I took a bunch of acid I was high for three days no you didn't if you took something and you were high for three days it might have been DOM it might have been STP but it was not LSD or you were just dramatizing and making stuff up for attention because it doesn't matter how much LSD you take, that's not going to happen. Um, lots and lots of myths around this stuff, but I just wanted to mention that, that it is so incredibly safe, and uh, it even seems to have um, safety mechanisms kind of built into it, because if you try to abuse it and keep taking it, keep taking it, keep taking it, uh, what will happen is it'll just stop working, um, and you have to double the dose uh, if you take it consecutive days, and then even more than double it after only a few days. So there's like built-in mechanisms. Psilocybin has this as well. DMT does not. Um, but I think DMT is a lot less, ayahuasca in particular, is a lot less prone um, to abuse. It's not, I wouldn't even call it fun exactly. I mean, it's amazing, but fun is probably the wrong word, <laughs> um, at least for me. Uh, so where are we at with this? Um, Back to Albert Hoffman. So he either got it in his eye or in his mouth because it does not soak into your skin, no matter what anyone tells you. It's not true. Um, and uh, also while we're on the subject of busting myths, there's also no such thing as dirty LSD. It's either LSD or it's not LSD. And it's really easy to understand this. And someone that I met has actually talked to Brotherhood of Eternal Love LSD chemists about this. I don't know who that might have been, but somebody somewhere... Uh, <laughs> and um, definitely from the horse's mouth uh, there are and this is what I always thought that there's no impurity on earth there's nothing that is a byproduct of the synthesis of LSD that is so potent in the 100-200 microgram range even if you took the byproduct pure it would not have any noticeable impact right? it would have no effect so if you take 200 micrograms of LSD and there's a tiny little bit of some byproduct in there, you're not going to feel it. No such thing as dirty LSD. You either have something off in your body, it's something that you ate, it's something that is lodged in your spiritual energetic being, your emotional body, whatever it is, 
No such thing as dirty acid. It might not be acid. It could be ALD-52. It could be 1PLSD. It could be fucking a whole big long list of analogs and similar chemicals. And the chemist makes one little mistake and he has something that's like LSD. You know what I mean? So, but facts is facts. There's not strychnine in it. It's just stupid. There's no, no reason to do that. You know, people used to say you have to use it to bond it to paper and stuff. It's not real. Um, <clears throat> so back to Dr. Hoffman. He gets some in his mouth. He gets some on his eyeball, whatever happened, and he's riding his bike home, and in his words, uh, he was overwhelmed by phantasmic, phantagoric, phantagoric phantasms, something along those lines, fantastic phantasms, (laughs) Uh, you know, and so he was like, what in the fuck was that? And so he goes back to the lab, and he knows, well, I handled this stuff, and I spilled a little bit on my hand, so... Um, maybe if I just take, I think, 500 micrograms or something, because at the time, there was nothing that would be active in the 500 microgram range. So he thought, this is a tiny, tiny little bit of LSD and no big deal. And he goes to ride his bike home, and he is, uh, I think this is actually the second time is when he got overwhelmed by the fantastic phasmagorums, or however he put it. And then so he went home and he called the doctor and the doctor came and he said, you know, your heart rate's a little weird, but you're definitely overall just fine. And that was the discovery of LSD. And this was happening more or less in step with um, uh, Huxley uh, having his experience um, and writing a book about it. And so while all that is happening, there's a guy named Dr. Timothy Leary who has had a hell of a time over the last couple of years. And um, I would strongly suggest to anyone out there to read his book, High Priest, uh, because it is an extraordinary tale of, you know, synchronicities uh, with an improbability factor that just are, you know, up there with the Big Bang or something. I mean, it's... Uh, it's it's pretty pretty uh, pretty incredible stuff um but i'm going to just do a, a quick synopsis i guess and so dr leary had just lost his wife to suicide uh he was severely depressed and alcoholic so he took his two kids jack and susan um to france where he got extremely sick his hands swelled up like two balloons and he had a headache and it was just like that Pink Floyd song, Comfortably Numb, weirdly uh, similar. I, he may have written that book after that song came out and kind of drew from that as, I don't know, it's weird. But basically, Comfortably Numb happened to him. And um, so he, he got a job at Harvard in the psychiatry department. And he went to Harvard to work because they were paying him a lot of money, I'm sure. And some colleague, no, 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 here, oh, we miss Gordon Wasson. Okay, so somewhere between um, Huxley taking mescaline and uh, Hoffman discovering that he had LSD in his laboratory, there was another guy named Gordon Wasson who was, I think, president of Sears and Roebuck or CEO of Sears and Roebuck, definitely a banker. Um, He and his wife, Valentina, had become extremely fascinated in um, mushrooms, and they had noticed that some people in some areas tended to worship them. So we have the, um, I guess, Nordic, like the Vikings um, and the Sungus, um, who are a Siberian tribe uh, that eat the um, Amanita in various ways. in, in the case of, I think it's the Sungus, they eat them and the big warriors eat them and then they pee and the pee is still psychoactive and then everyone else drinks the pee because the big warriors filter out the more toxic stuff. Way easier to just sun dry it and convert the, um, I think it's the muscamol to ibotenic acid. Um, sun drying does that, so it makes it a lot. Uh, no, not J.P. Morgan. Are, are you saying he worked for J.P. Morgan? Yeah, well, something like that. Some Babylon shit. <laughs> so um, so he noticed that, that there was some Amanita eating going on, and also he had heard somehow about how there were uh, indigenous people in Mexico and other places that ate um, these little mushrooms that they believed walked in the footsteps of Jesus. Um, they had not believed that they wa- that they grew in the footsteps of Jesus for long, but that's where they were at by the time they intersected with Gordon Wasson. So Wasson flies down to Mexico and he meets a woman named Maria Sabina. <clears throat> 
And Maria Sabina gives him like an unbelievable dose of mushrooms. I mean, I've known this story for 30 years or something, but I only recently found out the dosage <laughs> that she gave him. And I guess she was thinking, you know, we're going to just really just wake these crackers up. Like it was ridiculous. I don't want to say, but I think it was like 30 grams or something. Um, just absolutely just sent them to another dimension. And so um, I, I, I'm going to put out an actual video of, with all this stuff in much more detail with, you know, graphics and um, and s more specific details because I'm literally telling you guys all this stuff from memory from having studied it like 30 years ago or something. But um, the next exact sequence of events is not that important, but I'm not 100% that I have it chronologically exactly correct. But more or less what happened is that Gordon Wasson ate this stuff and he thought, well, if <clears throat> some shit like this exists, probably should tell somebody in psychiatry at Harvard. <laughs> and so he sent um, the mushrooms to... Is that... Yeah, he sent the mushrooms to Leary. And Leary... Uh, or maybe he just, no, he told Leary, he told them, he sent him a letter because then Leary got his colleagues together and flew to Cuernavaca and they rented a mansion and they found the mushrooms and they ate a ton of them. Leary was 53 years old when he had this first psychedelic experience. I think it was like 1959 or something like that. And so after this insane, you know, week in Cuernavaca with these Harvard psychiatry you know, board member people tripping in this mansion. Uh, and it's all in High Priest. Definitely recommend that you guys all read the book if you haven't. Uh, they fly back to Harvard, and Hoffman has had the same thought that he should send this stuff to the psychiatry department at Harvard. So Leary more or less gets back. You know, I don't know if this happened immediately, but I'm pretty sure it was with like within a week. Uh, he gets back to Harvard, and there are... <clears throat> LSD pills um, sitting on his desk. And so when that happens, he's like, huh, let me try this. And he eats it and he's like, wow, that's almost exactly the same as the psilocybin that I just ate. So he sends Hoffman the uh, mushrooms to have him analyze. And so Albert Hoffman becomes uh, the, he gets the prestigious distinction of having um, synthesized LSD for the first time, which actually would get a second um, like layer of prestige because it was the first time that a chemical was synthesized in the laboratory before it was found in nature. And a few years after the synthesis of LSD, someone figured out that there was lysergic acid amide which is, you know, LSD is lysergic acid diethylamide, and the morning glory LSD is LSA, lysergic acid amide. So it's very, very similar. It's a much gnarlier trip. I mean, it's not. By the way, too, if you're going to try that, which I'm not advising anything algorithm, um, and I'm actually not because I think there are easier ways to go about this, but if you can't help yourself, um, if you eat the blue ones and your skin turns blue, don't panic. You're not dying. I thought I was dying because I thought, oh, my God, there's probably pesticides. I bought the seeds at Walmart. You know, I was like 15 or something. And, and uh, their skin turned blue, and we're like, oh, my God, what the fuck is happening to us? And um, it turned out that uh, the dye that makes the flowers blue is already in the seeds. And so um, if you eat a high dose of heavenly blue morning glory seeds, a lot of times the pigment in your skin will temporarily turn blue which is pretty scary if you're, you know, feeling super sick because it's much more toxic than LSD. <clears throat> LSD is, like, ex actually extremely non-toxic as far as, like, you know, uber-powerful chemicals go. Um, the lethal dose is something insane, like a half a gallon or something for a 150-pound uh, man or 185-pound man. I can't remember what the LD50 is based on exactly, but um, at any rate, so, uh, yeah, so LSD was the first chemical that was discovered in a laboratory before an analog was discovered in nature. 
and Albert Hoffman became the first person to isolate psilocybin and psilocin and figure out what was going on with these mushrooms. And so from there, <laughs> um, Leary meets up with Algis Huxley and Allen Ginsberg and another, um, I can't remember everyone that was there, but certainly Leary was there, Huxley was there, and they created a sort of <clears throat> group of uh, intellectuals that were in the know, that had experienced psychedelics, and they knew something big was happening. And they had to figure out what to do about it. And um, of course, Leary was like raving mad, like we need to put it in the water and turn on the whole goddamn world. They're all gonna kill us if we don't. Like, you know what I mean? He wasn't wrong. He definitely wasn't wrong. Um, and I've seen an old video of him that is amazing where he is like, you know, they stick a bunch of cameras in his face because he's a Harvard doctor and it's the late 1950s, or early 1960s. And people totally are just like, you know, well, what should we do, doctor? You know, and he's like, um, well, maybe instead of getting angry with your children, you should turn on with them. See what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it and try to understand it yourselves. You know, and so the, the establishment is going like, holy fucking crap. We got this Harvard psychiatrist going on the news and telling people to eat acid with their kids. Like, they lost their shit, um, obviously. And actually, Nixon called uh, Timothy Leary later on down the road. Um, I don't think it was Alan Watts. Um, uh, it's not Ellis H. It's Ellis A. Um, but yeah. So where was I at with this? Okay, yeah, so they really didn't like Timothy Leary. And um, this all happened because they had these meetings with at least Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, and Aldous Huxley. And Leary said that uh, Huxley would sit at these meetings with his eyes closed, and then every once in a while he would just sit up and make a diamond pure comment and then fold his arms back up and go into his meditative pose or whatever. Uh, but Huxley was of the opinion that they should only that they should be kept quiet, and that only uh, scientists, philosophers, politicians. Um, by the way, for the first time in my lifetime, I have heard a presidential candidate candidate advocate psychedelics, including ayahuasca. Uh, RFK Jr. has been talking about um, the benefits of ayahuasca in some of the podcasts he's been doing which blew my mind to hear him his son has taken it he's all about it <clears throat> he also knew um antidotes that are extremely obscure that not really blew my mind like stuff that i'm the only person i've ever like encountered that had ever heard some of these things like that uh, lsd was going to be the 13th step um and aa and that's actually why one of the founders split with the organization because they were like no 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 um yeah he knew that story um, so interesting times. Here we are again, psychedelic explosion on the horizon, uh, on the verge of civil war, all kinds of cultural clashes going on, uh, some ridiculous war looming in the horizon and some Kennedy trying to ride in on a white steed and get himself shot in the head. Like this is one of the reasons I was saying we have to look back into the past to figure out what to do in the future. And it's not just about getting lessons. Uh, learning lessons so that we don't repeat them again. It's my opinion that um, history is literally just these, like, it's energy and there are patterns and geometries in it. And it is so specific, the repetition of these cycles, that, I mean, look how similar the moment we are in now is to the last time we were in exactly the same um, position. The only thing that is different is the magnitude of everything has become greater. Um, the, um, what is it, like the gamble, um, uh, there's a better word, not the odds, the, uh, what's, you know, on the line, um, is greater. The magnitude of the potential shitstorm is <laughs> off the Richter scale, so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so Huxley is like, we need to keep this quiet. We need to give it to the politicians and the artists and the whatever. And, and Leary's like, nope, nope. I'm calling all the news agencies. I got Harvard clout dog. I'm going to blow this shit up. And, um, that's what he did. And so a lot of people have blamed, uh, Timothy Leary for prohibition and, um, 
accused him of being a federal agent and all sorts of hate. Um, and by the way, if you haven't read any Timothy Leary, Neuropolitik and a lot of the other talks that he gave and stuff, man, he's, I think, more important than Terrence McKenna. And one of the reasons I did this stream is because I, it just bugs me that people are ignoring him. Um, there's like 2.2 thousand videos on YouTube about uh, McKenna, but only a few hundred about Timothy Leary. And I think that's it's pretty tragic because Tim Leary is arguably more important. Um, and more profound in his writings and his talks. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see, where are we at with this? Uh, but the reality is that it wasn't Leary's fault. Uh, what actually happened is there were um, studies going on all over the place. And I um, uh, wish I could remember the guy's name. You can find him on YouTube talking about the moment that this happened. But they were all studying psychedelics all over the place, and they were just blown away. You know, they, I think MDMA had just been um, synthesized too. So, you know, they're looking at this stuff and they're going like, "Whoa, we can fix everything with this." Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, the guy was um, Winona Ryder's um, father. Michael Hollingshead, um, Tim Leary was Winona Ryder's godfather, by the way, in case uh, any of you guys weren't aware of that. Yeah, the, the uh, psilocybin prison project, super interesting Leary experiment that he did, um, <clears throat> taking huge uh, heroic doses of psilocybin in a prison with a bunch of murderers and shit. <laughs> um, but what was I saying about... Uh, my known a writer and okay so there's these experiments going on and um one of the researchers um said as his i don't know what you call it like his conclusion or whatever that he submitted to the federal government that commissioned him to do the studies that uh these compounds can treat every known psychological aberration and oftentimes with a single dose I think Big Pharma got wind of that, and they said, send men with guns and stop this shit now. So it had nothing to do with Timothy Leary. I mean, it might not have helped <clears throat> that, you know, he was uh, telling people on the news to eat acid with their kids or whatever, but um, the, real, the real hammer came down when the researchers submitted these papers to the federal government, not saying we need to protect the public from, oh yeah, we didn't talk about the uh, acid test, but we're not there yet. We're not quite there yet. Um, <clears throat> I probably will make it all the way to the present day before we're done. Um, but uh, yeah, so the federal government uh, on at the behest of Big Pharma, uh, and, and if you guys think about the social impact, the cost of that, um, considering, you know, in light of the research that has been done again recently, and we're hearing eerie echoes of those original researchers coming from places like John Hopkins, where we're being told that, again, almost exactly the same words, he probably did this deliberately, but one of the researchers at John Hopkins said, we can treat basically every known psychological problem um, oh, no, actually, I remember exactly what he said. It is simply unprecedented in the history of psychiatry that, a sing that a, any compound can treat so many psychological issues with, oftentimes with a single dose. That's what he said. And I don't know if you guys noticed that whole thing about single dose that keeps coming up. Can't make much money off that, right? So, um, yeah, that's why psychedelics were banned. And what I was saying is if you think about all the addictions, um, they're saying that... Um, uh, addiction can be treated uh, with a 85% higher success rate than any conventional therapy. Can you imagine how many less drunk driving deaths there would be, how many less crackheads would be out robbing? You know what I mean? If this stuff had been legal and used as it needs to be used all the way back to the 1950s when they first became aware of this, how much different would our society, like what did they really do to us? by banning psychedelics for all these years, not to mention all the innocent people that have been sitting in prison. But um, when you really think about the social harm that they did by lying and denying people access to these life-saving, life-changing compounds, it's just absolutely 
the, one of the greatest um, grievances that humanity has against its overlords, quite likely the, the absolute highest. And so the hammer came down, <clears throat> and the men with guns showed up, and they said, this is done now, today. You're done now. They were, like, literally in the middle of, like, you know, this one researcher, uh, you can find him on YouTube. I, I don't know his name, but, um, you know, they were in the middle of, like, LSD sessions with people, and the guys came with the paperwork saying, you're done as of now. This is illegal as of now. Um, and so that was that. Um, and somebody mentioned uh, King Kesey and the Grateful Dead and that whole thing, and uh, that is actually really important because um, without two people, um, namely Jerry Garcia and Terrence McKenna, uh, this whole psychedelic revolution or psychedelic renaissance would have died probably in the 1970s because the Matrix basically dangled some houses and cars and you know comfort in front of the hippies and they all just became yuppies and forgot what the fuck they were doing and just went to work and uh now they're boomers and whatever so um that happened <laughs> but uh luckily <clears throat> there was a guy named king kesey who wrote a book called one flew over the cuckoo's nest and there are some incredible interviews i actually bought uh all of the existing uh video footage of the acid tests uh, from King Kesey's son at a fish concert um, many years ago. Pulled up next to the further bus, and I just couldn't believe it. Um, and I thought he was King Kesey for a second because he looked so much like him, and then I realized, wait a minute, are you dead? And then he had a picture of Kesey on his shirt, and I was like, wait a minute, what the fuck's going on? And I was like, are you his son? Sure enough, and a couple of Garcia's daughters were on the further bus. It was insane. Uh, and he sold me the footage of the acid test. And in the beginning, there's this interview uh, where the press, because this was slightly before the guys with guns showed up, I think like 1966, at the same year, it's 1965, excuse me, so 1966 is when they federally uh, made LSD legal, and 1965, the acid tests, uh, where the Grateful Dead played their first gig as the Grateful Dead um, at King Kesey's parties in L.A., and I don't remember where the other one was, but um, basically a couple thousand people came to these places where they had these gigantic um, barrels and uh, in the video you can actually watch Owsley who was the Grateful Dead sound man and the chemist that made most of the LSD that was consumed in the 1960s. Um, interestingly the other guy that made the Orange Sunshine and pretty much all the rest of it um, recently died in the same town that I happened to move to in Ecuador. His widow was still there um, which was insane to realize like of all the places I could end up this random town in Ecuador where this LSD chemist has retired. Um, but yeah, he died almost as soon as I got there, but yeah, that was a mind blower. Uh, so what was I saying? Um, okay, so Owsley was at the acid test and they're putting all this crystal LSD into these big barrels and mixing it up with Kool-Aid and there are Hell's Angels running around, you know, just as friendly as puppies and twirling around people climbing through the rafters naked brushing their hair straight up over and over and over and over and over and over and over like it was complete madness and they were taking massive massive doses and it was totally legal so that was a pivotal moment because that is when the grateful dead realized that telepathy was real according to them you know for one thing they said that they figured out that they could actually trade bodies with people and just you know, zip around the room and experience the band from the perspective of the collective mind or from an individual in the audience or from their own perspective or Jerry could flow over into Phil's body and play bass or whatever they needed to do along with all sorts of other revelations. And they were also, um, you know, students of the mysteries. <clears throat> so uh, there was that connection as well. But uh, we all know what happened after that. This jug band took LSD, and before they were done, they were buying spare parts from NASA so that they could build their sound system out of pieces from the space shuttle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Jug band takes LSD, makes a billion dollars, changes the world. Like, it sounds like a joke, but that's actually what happened. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get too much into the Grateful Dead thing, although it is amazing. But basically what happened is the Grateful Dead uh, uh, basically was the distribution system for all of this LSD that kept this psychedelic movement alive and the energy at those concerts. 
uh, was the other thing, this torch that, you know, people forgot what the fuck was going on throughout the 70s and 80s. People became shallow. They were all fucking fumed out on hairspray and, you know, their spandex pants were choking out their blood circulation and it was a mess. By the way, you guys, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon uh, where you can join our secret streams and there are options to provide support in the chat. I am demonetized. And, uh, you know, as you can see, I've been talking for about two hours telling you this entire history off the top of my head. Um, so if you support that sort of thing, please show it. Um, <laughs> um, what is this? Uh, so where are we at with this? Okay, so the LSD and uh, mushrooms and the whole energy, the torch basically was carried by the Grateful Dead through the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Um, the only other influence that was really, really repping that shit was Terrence McKenna. And I'm sure most of you guys know the Terrence McKenna story, so I'll just touch on it. But he was basically a over-educated, upper-middle-class kid from Peoria, uh, Colorado. Um, <clears throat> and he and his brother, who was actually a neuroscientist, uh, or at least he is now, um, went to Columbia and they were looking for ayahuasca, much in the same way that um, William S. Burroughs and uh, uh, Tim Leary were back in the day, in the 50s. And um, I think the story is that they did not find the ayahuasca, but they did find um, Amazon subcubensis growing all over the place. And trust me, if you find cattle here... I mean, and now it's sad because of the deforestation, but you can literally pick psilocybin mushrooms all day, every day. Like, you could just start picking in one spot and just keep walking and picking, and they'll never run out, like, ever. Like, you'll, you won't be able to walk, the sun will go down, you know what I mean? Like, you're, you could just fill pickup trucks all day or something. It's fucking crazy. Uh, and then in uh, the mountains here, there's also... Um, Pinellas uh, cyanesin, which is much, much stronger and a much, much better experience. I, I much prefer those. We don't find those here in the jungle much. Um, so they ate a ton of mushrooms. Uh, from reading the stories, it sounds like McKenna basically had a psychotic break, but these psilocybin-induced psychotic breaks are much more like the traditional mystical experience of piercing the veil. Uh, and it sounds like they connected with some interdimensional intelligences, downloaded a bunch of information, um, some of which may not have been exactly accurate, but time will only tell. Uh, one of the most interesting things, though, is the holographic theory of mind. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you really want to understand where McKenna and his brother, or the McKenna brothers were coming from, uh, having a background in hermeticism and the mystery school traditions is extremely important. There's another um, super, super important figure named Joseph Campbell, who was a Harvard mythologist that was really important to the story. And it's thanks to him that these people had books and access to a lot of writings on the mysteries. Um, he really was extremely important. And somehow, even though he was like an old square uh, you know, Harvard mythologist from like, you know, he was way old by the time the Grateful Dead existed, but he ended up at Grateful Dead concerts and he actually said of the Grateful Dead that they were the antidote to the atom bomb. And he also said that he had seen actual natural magic twice in his life, once in the jungles of Borneo and at Grateful Dead concerts. So uh, there's actually, if you're interested, there are, um, <clears throat> or there is one interview of Joseph Campbell and Jerry Garcia actually being interviewed together, which is just it's fucked up. It's just insane. I can't believe that happened. But, um, yeah, so the point is, though, that if you really want to understand the McKenna brothers, uh, you, you know, you need to understand um, the hermetic teachings and books like the Kabbalion and the works of people like Aleister Crowley because um, a lot of the ideas, I think, that are just kind of, People think that they just sort of came out of the McKenna's all of a sudden. That's not what happened. There was evolution, and there was a process, and there was a lineage, as there always is in these shamanic traditions, where um, the knowledge is transmitted from person to person and from plant to person. But, um, yeah, so after the experiences in um, South America... Uh, Terrence eventually got his head together a little bit, a lot of bit maybe, 
and uh, went on to, of course, write a bunch of books about DMT and to rant about DMT and also to trick everyone. Uh, and it's important, I think, that we all take note of this because most of us take psychedelics to make ourselves better people. And um, in a similar way that I have seen a lot of predatory people sneak into vegan communities because they think, well, all vegans are spiritual and elevated and therefore no vegan could ever mean anyone harm because they can't even hurt a fucking bee. You know what I mean? It's not real. Um, and psychedelics are also not a guarantee that, you know, a person is going to be 100% forthright. And it actually turns out that Terrence McKenna almost definitely um, fudged his numbers and knew that he did that and knew that his time wave zero mathematics did not work and that novelty theory was not correct. And so there was an entire movement expecting the end of the world in 2012 or for us to pass, in, pass into a fifth dimensional reality where novelty, which was supposed to be, <clears throat> and I think novelty is real, just for the record, but his omega point was not. And uh, the idea was that novelty is basically um, the force that causes creativity, uh, to put it like very simply. Um, and he was positing that it ebbs and flows uh, through um, human history <clears throat> in much the same way that other forces uh, like gravity and electromagnetic energy and all of these kind of things do. Um, but uh, <clears throat> he challenged the mathematical community to do... Uh, um, to, to check his math, I think, assuming that no one would take him seriously and that no one would do it, and uh, someone did. And he wrote a paper called um, Autopsy of a Mathematical Theory. And um, he said that he noticed that there was a string of numbers that had been reversed in order to make the equations work and that appeared to have been done deliberately. And when he confronted Terence about it, he basically just acted like you would expect someone to act when they get caught in a massive lie. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm not trying to say that Terence McKenna did not offer a tremendous amount of benefit, that his role on this planet wasn't extraordinarily important. But I think it is also important that we take note <clears throat> of the missteps of our heroes <clears throat> and learn from the mistakes of the people that came before us and to also not make the mistake that, as Aleister Crowley put, is the most common for any magician to believe that his magic can do more for him than it can. And that would mean that, in this case, that psychedelics are going to necessarily make people 100% honest and good. And, uh, you know, it's really important to remember that narcissists can survive psychedelics um, and that, you know, it's if it's not taken with the right intent under the right circumstances, um, by the right people and all of that sort of stuff that there are absolutely no guarantees. There are limitations and um, everyone is human and can make mistakes. So, you know, I'm still a huge fan of Terrence McKenna in general. He was a massive influence on my um, early development, I guess. And, uh, you know, I mean, but we need to take note of that uh, little bit of deviancy there, I think. <clears throat> um, there's one other figure that I didn't mention that I'm, uh, he did not play nearly the pivotal role that the rest of these people did, but I think was, you know, maybe even more important, at least in terms of like consciousness and, um, just his writings, I think were far more advanced than Terrence McKenna or Timothy Leary. Um, although, uh, Robert Anton Wilson did actually really, really, really look up to Timothy Leary. I mean, he considered him important, um, beyond words. And uh, Timothy Leary had that same respect for Robert Anton Wilson. In fact, he said that the book, The Illuminatus Trilogy, uh, which is to this day my favorite book, and even though it's 1,100 pages long and very difficult to read, every single person I have ever recommended it to has read it at least three times. I've probably read it six. Uh, it is absolutely extraordinary, and it actually contains um, <clears throat> the, f the only like absolutely documented uh, precognition that is basically indisputable. And there's actually video of him in his last interview before he died uh, that you can find on YouTube talking about this. But in the Illuminatus trilogy, there was a pyramid at the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean. And he gives the um, coordinates. And in 2003, right before he died, that pyramid was actually located at the bottom of the ocean in exactly that spot, and he actually lived to see that. And um, there are also, uh, in the early part of the book, and this is in the early 1970s it was written, 
There are terrorist attacks that are staged by the government with the purpose of stripping people's rights away. Um, basically, 9-11 is in the book, uh, 1974. So uh, I really, really strongly recommend Robert Anton Wilson, especially um, Prometheus Rising uh, and Cosmic Tri Trigger 1 and 2. Uh, Cosmic Trigger 1 is the final secret of the Illuminati, and he's not kidding. So um, definitely check out Robert Anton Wilson, but overall he doesn't play as much a, of a significant role in our story. Um, he's just sort of a supporting um, cast character. And so that basically brings us to the present moment where um, Rome is burning. Um, people are more divided than they've probably ever been at any point in my life. Yes, Pope Bob. Somebody's asking what are Crowley's biggest sins. No one knows. Um, Crowley definitely wrote a lot of very, very regrettable things. Most of them were meant to be jokes. Um, and some of the most horrible stuff, he actually said that they were exercises because he felt like if you really wanted to understand the omnip omnipotent consciousness that underlies the, totali the total totality of existence, that you needed to understand from the darkest possible places to the absolute highest and lightest, um, my prophets, uh, heads will rise above their heavens. My prophets heads will rise above the heavens, but their feet will drag below the hills. So it's not clear what he actually may or may not have done. And personally, I don't, I don't really care that much because the teachings and the, um, the way that he was able to articulate, uh, these sort of initiated, secrets of consciousness there's no one else that wrote with that kind of precision and concision and literary pyrotechnics there's definitely unrivaled period end of story um so that's you know basically the value of uh alistair crowley um Man, I uh, feel like we were almost... Okay, so we're, we're back. We're up to the present day. Um, Daniel Pinchbeck, who cares? I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but there's just really nothing, like, groundbreaking or... Um, and also, there's been a lot of scandal around that guy, so it, and the kind of, kind of bad stuff, speaking of the sins of Crowley. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, and then there was this guy that was, like, eating mushrooms and holding his breath for 15 minutes in martial arts and all this stuff, but I... I tried to watch one of his videos. I can't remember his name, and I apologize for that. But uh, I, he was just making stuff up, like things that I knew to be absolutely false over and over again right away. And I just, I've just i never looked anymore into him. So, you know, I you guys let me know, too, if there are psychedelic luminaries that exist in the current moment that I'm not aware of. You know, please fill me in. Um, but, you know, I <clears throat> that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this series of videos is that I don't really feel like we have that, and people have lost uh, the connection and appreciation uh, with Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson and even Huxley, you know, the, the uh, what do you call them, essays of Huxley. <clears throat> but we definitely have found ourselves um, perched precariously on a perilous, <laughs> perilously perched on a precipice, precarious precipice, um, pondering, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. I mean, we're in deep shit. And uh, the future is extremely uncertain. So um, I think it's really important for us to really avail of ourselves of every bit of wisdom uh, and utilize all of the, the resources um, to try to get our compass oriented, to figure out how it is that we can rise above our um, schisms, stop playing the ism schism game, and find some unity amidst uh, the roar of propaganda and chaos and confusion and illusion and delusion and actually get something done. It is an extraordinary um, waste of human potential that we have already had to endure over the last you know, 50, 60 years that we had an opportunity to reconcile a lot of our issues and heal a lot of our ancestral trauma with psychedelics and plant medicine. And that was unfairly taken from us uh, in the interest of the profit of a very small group of people. And the, um, 
collateral damage of that has been, you know, tens of thousands of lives. Uh, addiction is running absolutely rampant in the streets. Um, violence is, uh, you know, absolutely incredibly abundant. Uh, you know, wars that are unnecessary. Uh, and people are still um, predisposed to uh, indoctrination uh, by propaganda and political agendas. Um, and it seems to me that free thinking, uh, um, you know, critically thinking uh, people are increasingly uncommon, despite the fact that the demand is higher than ever. And the ability to transcend um, those traps is more readily available to all of these people than ever. And psychedelics have the capacity to actually allow us to upgrade our hardwire, to rewire our brains, to transcend our traumas, and to do even more than that, to uh, transmute them um, from the lead of you know darkness and pain and suffering and tragedy into the gold of higher consciousness and spiritual awareness and metacognition, and not a moment too soon. We are, <clears throat> um, and, and this is the way of the universe. You know, everything contains its contradiction, and that includes moments. So there's this juxtaposition of opportunity and crisis. And this moment is more pregnant with both things, the potential for calamity and the potential for transcendence um, than, you know, very likely any other moment in human history. You would hope, though, so, so. I mean, there should be some sort of point to the evolutionary process. And we've all probably noticed at this point that there is a telescopic nature to the evolutionary paradigm, that the evolution of consciousness of the race moves faster and faster and faster. And with momentum um, comes power and magnitude and you know the scale of the impact um, that can be created and so, you know, I don't know who said this, but uh, whatever you're doing, you should not be bored. Um, this is truly an exciting time. And, uh, you know, just for an example, <clears throat> um, as far as like the political uh, stuff that's happening in the world, you know, I mean, I checked out of that many, many years ago because I realized that the, the people that are running the show have got the scene you know, locked down. They're totally in control of their puppets, and they're not going to let anyone near the White House that isn't completely under their control. You know, they're puppets, or they're not allowed to play. And um, I think that it's extremely possible, although, of course, you know, could be wrong, but it's extremely possible that Kennedy uh, has uh, a vendetta because he believes that they killed his father, they killed his uncle, they killed two of his cousins. Um, and he's older, and he just doesn't care, and he's willing to take them on. And I would never would have seen that coming, you know? And that's been, like, one of the big uh, impediments that I've seen. Like, how can we possibly find a chink in, uh, uh, or um, the missing scale in the armor of smog uh, to deliver the arrow that finally brings down Babylon, or at least renders it um, constrained to the will of the people as it's supposed to be? And um, maybe I'm being dramatic, but it certainly does seem at least possible that that uh, unexpected development has um, arrived. And so the point of it, I'm not necessarily trying to get you to support any political candidate. I'm just saying that even when um, it seems like you're absolutely doomed and there is no hope and no possibility, um, the most improbable shit that you could never have imagined will just all of a sudden happen. So even though we do seem hemmed in by the dominators, uh, as Terrence McKenna would have said, um, there's, it's always possible that some um, serendipitous, fortuitous, um, synchronistic, uh, astronomically improbable um, development will come out of nowhere. And so it's like, you have to put your foot <clears throat> in a space where there is 
no rock and step and then there's the rock <laughs> so uh <clears throat> and also you know i wanted to mention you guys that uh one of the themes of you know the teachings of the mysteries and uh the um traditions of shamanism and the western occult tradition and there are even some indications that support this in physics although the extent to which like the idea of the law of attraction or manifestation um to the, the extent to which th their act that stuff is supported by um physics at all is often exaggerated in popular culture for sure there's no doubt about that but um, there have been recent experiments that show that even though it's probably not like the movie The Secret would have you believe, it's not exactly unreal either. And the more people, uh, the more consciousness, it's basically just an electromagnetic influence, <laughs> right? When you have a whole lot of consciousness focused on the same thing, it's an electromagnetic influence. And so if we can find a way to unify our thoughts and wills, then we can have an impact that supersedes uh, what is directly explainable and observable. Um, and I really hope that we can find um, that place of unity. Uh, and everyone knows there's great power there, but they won't let go of their wedge issues. They won't stop falling for the dominator trap of you know, fight about abortion, fight about race, fight about sexuality, fight about political parties, you know, argue about all this shit. One of the things I've noticed is that in the last like 10 or 20 years, 10 years even, um, there's actually more common ground for the left and the right to stand on than there ever has been before. Um, there's so much more commonality and yet they hate each other more than ever. And it's mostly because of wedge, wedge issues that actually only affect a very small percentage of the people on the fringes. That's the reality. And they have everyone completely obsessively fixated on these wedge issues to the extent that people don't realize that we really could just take our eyes off of that for a moment and resolve the greatest conflicts that um, humanity has ever confronted. One fell swoop. So thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. I've been talking for like a long time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and bugger off. But uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. And please do hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. There are options to contribute. A donation in the chat and in the description and i'll see you again very soon tomorrow actually <coughs> mm.